So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I was trained as a physician assistant, and I'm a member of the outreach team for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like this one today. Our guest today is Dr. Ellen Vora. She is board certified as a psychiatrist. She's also an acupuncturist, a yoga teacher, and she's author of the number one best-selling book, The Anatomy of Anxiety, which I have right here. Um, she takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalance at the root. Dr. Vora received her BA from Yale University and her MD from Columbia University. And she's also one of the experts that appears in our documentary film, Medicating Normal. So welcome, Dr. Vora. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, sure. So I've um, taken some time to read your book, which I, I appreciate that it was, you know, written in a way that I think like the lay person can understand. It's not so medical and complex or um, in a way that I feel like, you know, some of the books about anxiety and stuff like really get into the you know, physiology and things that people can't understand. I found it like really easily understandable and things that everybody I think could implement into their lives if they're really dealing with anxiety or looking at ways um, that are different from maybe conventional narratives of just like, just go to the doctor and take a pill. So um, I think we'll get into uh, first, maybe you explain how you're a holistic psychiatrist, but perhaps uh, people don't know what that is or how it's different from traditional psychiatry or even how maybe it influences the way you think about the term mental health. So can you explain some of that for people? Yeah. So I think no two holistic or integrative psychiatrists are alike. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a um, we define it for ourselves, but it's typically someone who's thinking about mental health in a much broader way than how we're trained. You know, we in our training, we really focus on mental health from the neck up. We're looking at this part of the body and thinking about brain chemistry and thoughts and behaviors. And really what I've come to observe is that um, the whole physical body impacts our mental health significantly. Mm -hmm. And there's this other component of our health, which is our psycho-spiritual health. And that pertains to our fundamental human needs for things like community and for being connected to nature, a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives, um, being of service, pleasure. And so we have all of these other determinants of our mental well-being. And I take all of that into consideration when I'm addressing someone's mental health. To me, it's not simply a genetic chemical imbalance that's impacting their brain chemistry, in fact, if there's even a, a change in our brain chemistry, I think that's often a downstream effect of all of these other upstream root causes of our mental health that begin in the physical body and in our psycho-spiritual lives. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> so more specifically, I'm remembering someone in your book named Janelle, I guess it was one of your patients who... When you met her, she was heavily medicated with psychiatric drugs and she was diagnosed bipolar. And you explained that you discovered she had Hashimoto's and uh, which is a thyroid condition. And then you talk in the book too about how even birth control pills, for example, can cause changes in moods. So I wonder as a holistic psychiatrist then, how much of what we're calling you know, mental illness and diagnosing as mental illness, do you think is some legitimate root cause, like, you know, medical or chemicals exposures that's maybe never been tested for or just gone undiagnosed? Yeah, I mean, not to get too philosophical too soon, even that question of like, you know, how much of what we're calling mental illness is actually a physical ailment masquerading as mental illness. I think even that question reveals our societal views and our conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what we're always looking at are mental symptoms, 
like we are reporting on the fact that someone's symptoms are showing up in this sphere of mental health. So um, there's some imbalance. It's happening on the level of the genes, on an epigenetic level, on a level of physical imbalance, um, on an autoimmune disease level, or perhaps on a psychospiritual level, or some combination of these things. Mm -hmm. And in a given individual, this could be showing up as symptoms like depressed mood, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, racing thoughts, difficulty sleeping. But all of these are really just symptoms. And they don't necessarily speak to what is this? That, mm -hmm. that idea is a throwback to really what was the crowning achievement of Western medicine, which is antibiotics, where we're like, well, what is this? This is, you know, this is syphilis. Therefore, the treatment is penicillin, and therefore we've cured somebody. And that was a beautiful system. And I feel like we as Western physicians keep trying to get back to those glory days. Mm -hmm. uh, we caught it, we identified what this is, we found the treatment and it's a cure and we're done. And we feel so potent, we feel like heroes as physicians, Our patients are happy. But in 2022, we're dealing in the much more amorphous vagaries of uh, chronic illnesses, chronic degenerative illnesses, largely things related to inflammation. And so we can't really say, well, this person has this, this, this symptom of depression or anxiety, and therefore this equals major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. And with the implication being, and therefore the treatment is a particular medication and it will cure it. I think we're trying to mold what doesn't belong in that framework into that. Um, so really all we're reporting on are symptoms and what the true root cause is can be different for everybody. And typically we're not even looking in the right places for those root causes. Okay. So you just mentioned inflammation and in the book, you talk about a competing theory to the chemical imbalance theory called the cytokine or inflammatory hypothesis. What, what's behind that hypothesis? Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch upon that. And then if you want, we can also circle back around to Janelle with Hashimoto's and the birth sure. control conversation, if that's yeah. useful. But basically, you know, we have all come of age with what's called the monoamine hypothesis of depression. The mm -hmm. one that says it's our brain chemistry, it's our serotonin. And, um, you know, it's really always been marketing and a narrative to help us make sense, but it's never been robustly supported by the medical literature. And right now we even have this kind of huge upset in the field where we've shown like, actually it's not related to a chemical imbalance. Um, and so there's always been this competing hypothesis called the cytokine or inflammatory hypothesis of depression. It's not to say this explains all of depression. It just explains this particular silo of depression, which is when it's related to inflammation. And this is more robustly supported by the medical literature where we can see cases where um, depressive symptoms even track with presence of cytokines or inflammatory molecules in the brain. And this hypothesis makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And to me, it speaks to, I always look at everything through an ancestral lens, kind of like, you know, what would have been an adaptive response on the proverbial savanna of evolution. And if you're inflamed on the savanna of evolution, then it makes sense. You probably are inflamed from some kind of, you know, maybe you drank the wrong pond water. There's something off in the balance of flora in your body mm -hmm. and you would want to retreat to your cave. You might be contagious. You want to create the conditions for your body to heal. And so social isolation, um, resting in the dark, feeling tired, not wanting to, um, work or socialize, all of that would be an adaptive response to inflammation under those circumstances. But these days, because the modern environment has us all so chronically inflamed, mm -hmm. we're going through our lives in a chronic low-grade state of inflammation. And I believe it's creating what's really chronic low-grade depression. Because if you look at all of those symptoms of the sick response, they line up pretty closely with what we would characterize as depression. Yeah. And did you want to say something more about the, the Janelle story too? Yeah. So, so Janelle, a patient of mine, I still work with her to this day. She came to me um, on a lot of mood stabilizers um, and really heavy, she was heavily medicated and she reported to me about a pretty traumatic involuntary inpatient hospitalization on a psychiatric unit. 
Um, and basically she was considered manic um, and uh, unable to care for herself in the community. She was involuntarily hospitalized and no one checked her thyroid. And what we uncovered much later is that she had this um, unidentified, untreated, unmanaged thyroid condition where when she was in a state of relative hyperthyroidism, um, it was showing up as mania. And then when, it was in a, when she was in a state of relative hypothyroidism, it looked like depression and oscillating between those two states resembled what we would call bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. But in her case, this actually was, you know, purely physical showing up with mental health symptoms. So we've since addressed her thyroid condition and she's actually come off of at this point, all of her psychiatric medications slowly over many years, we did a very gradual supported taper with each and every one of them. And she's more stable now than she ever was when she was medicated. And certainly when she was in the community, you know, untreated and, and with just a very um, poorly functioning thyroid with a pretty flagrant autoimmune condition. Mm -hmm. So she's an interesting illustration of how sometimes we don't even think to look into the physical body to account for symptoms that we're calling mental health issues. And mm -hmm. she really wore that label of bipolar disease she, it, it impacted her narrative of herself and her sense of her identity. She's, you know, I am mentally ill. This is who I am. This is who I will always be. And no stigma or shame around any of that. But I think it's always worth looking at um, what's the true root here? Can we not be content with it's just this way and will always be this way? Can we roll up our sleeves, do the investigative work to always understand what is the body communicating to us right now? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you were in school, were you taught to think this way? Or was it something on your own that sort of made you seek out? Because anyone I know that's gone to medical school for psychiatry, and you know, I went and got my PA degree, there wasn't this sort of um, thinking about ancestral type concepts that you talk about. And especially around, um, you know, what what we call mental health or mental illness, um, root cause type investigation so much. So where did you start to think a little more critically? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I've learned so much from mentors in the field of functional medicine and people like Chris Kresser and Amy Myers and Kelly Brogan and, and other ancestral thinkers and functional medicine thinkers. But really, it started with a crisis that I was in, in when I was in medical school, mm -hmm. and there were sort of two parallel crises happening. One was that I felt really disenchanted with what I was being taught, and I didn't really feel like I was helping my patients. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was aware that I was being taught how to masterfully medicate, sort of be this, um, you know, masterful at devising these medication cocktails and to really know the nitty gritty and the nooks and crannies of interactions and, you know, creative off-label augmentation strategies. And so I would do this and I would patch up these patients, but as they would walk out of my office, I would always scratch my head and, and wonder, are they really the better for having just had that half an hour with me? Are they really thriving? Am I contributing to their overall well-being? Um, and I really did not feel like the answer was yes. I was really um, kind of slowly facing the truth, which is that all of this decade of education, all of this hard work and blood, sweat, and tears and expense had taught me to do something that I found actually disenchanting at the end of the day. And that crisis was happening in parallel with uh, my own physical health, my own mental health was a mess. And I had PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, ocular migraines, acne, autoimmune markers in my blood work, um, couldn't get a period, couldn't poop to save my life, um, had joint pain, had really all kinds of issues. And, um, and I remember going in to see my gynecologist and telling her how I hadn't gotten a period in six months and um, what I should do about this. And not only did I feel gaslit and invalidated and dismissed because of course, but also um, she told me, well, we'll just put you back on the pill. That's the solution. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, and it was my first touch with a functional mindset. I remember thinking like, 
I don't think that's a solution. I think that might be a band-aid, but then if I were to go back off the pill, it's not like my period would magically come back and I would still be this out of balance version of myself that was underneath that. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was my first touch into something's not right with this system. I think we're just suppressing symptoms. We're not addressing things at the root and resolving things at the root. So those two parallel crises really got me to think differently. Yeah, I think that's kind of common. I mean, I I was sort of in the same place going through PA school. It was like learning and regurgitating, but it wasn't until I actually became sick myself from psychiatric medications that I started like critically thinking and saying like, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense and other things made a lot more sense. And so sometimes it is like learning the hard way, you know, on your, on your own and with your own body. That's yeah. exactly right. It's a beautiful thing about these sort of alternative or complementary or holistic or functional spaces is that a lot of the practitioners got there through their own health journey. And yeah. so there's something like we really practice what we preach. We really live this medicine and we've witnessed in our own bodies how effective it can be. Yeah. So you talk about how you don't emphasize diagnosis in the work that you do. Why do you shy away from it? It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier with even the question of like how much of mental health are we actually misidentifying as mental health? Is it really physical health? I think these diagnoses, it's a nice idea that there is such a thing as depression or Mm -hmm. there is such a thing as anxiety. I think all we can really say with accuracy is that there are depressive and and anxiety symptoms, um, but they don't tell us what's going on. Mm -hmm. What's going on is a unique idiosyncratic collection of imbalances in any given individual. And it might draw on anything from trauma to gluten sensitivity and inflammation to like excessive blue light exposure after sunset. And so any given person, it's, it's not like this depression is the same as that depression. And it's not like even calling this depression tells us what to do about it. It always just tells us, well, in this individual, this is how imbalance is manifesting. But regardless, let's roll underlying imbalances. Yeah. Okay. And there's also, sense. there's one mm-hmm. other thing with diagnosis, which is that it can be a straitjacket. Mm-hmm. It can be this limiting belief where Um, we start to really identify with it and it can even keep us smaller rather than stepping into a more expansive life because we think, well, this is me. This will always be me. There's nothing that's going to change about this. It's part of our identity. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly like, this can be heard as shaming and, you know, that's never how I mean anything, especially this. Um, But I think that when I'm with one individual who's really taken on an identity of their mental health diagnosis, um, it's, it's not to invalidate all of that suffering and all the ways that that has informed their human experience, but it's really just to help open their eyes to the possibility of hope that you can feel differently. We can identify what might be contributing to these symptoms, address that, and you might feel so much different that it no longer makes sense to identify with that diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. So I want to move into anxiety in just a minute, but I want to make sure that people listening understand um, the whole ancestral primal type principles that you were just talking about. Um, In the book, you talk about um, approximating evolutionary conditions as much as possible in modern life. So what do you mean when you say that? It's basically just kind of working with our genes. And there's no like moral superiority to doing things the way we evolve. It's really just recognizing that if you sort of put human evolution across the width of this like Zoom screen, um, you know, here's, here's our evolution. And then like Doritos and phones after sunset are just this last sliver of the screen. And our genes just are not equipped to deal with those kinds of inputs. And so you see all of us struggling in modern life where where, our circadian rhythms are jacked up. We struggle to fall asleep and stay asleep. We're inflamed. We have bloating. We are depressed. We can't think clearly. We can't hold good attention. Um, We're miserable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have an industry that's all too happy to swoop in and say, 
this is your genetic destiny, this is who you are, and I've got a pill to fix it. But I just tend to believe that for the most part, with a few exceptions, the body works decently well and it requires certain inputs and it requires not irritants to the system. It requires not having irritants to the system. And that speaks to the fact that for this much span of human evolution, certain sets of conditions help keep us in balance. I'm not here to romanticize the past or say it was easy to be a hunter gatherer like that. I don't want to go and live in the bush and have to catch my own food. Like I am yeah. very much grateful to live in this era, but um, I think we have the shot at having the best of both worlds, recognizing the ways we need certain nutrients, the way we need a certain relationship to light to keep ourselves sleeping well, um, that our bodies require certain inputs. And I think it just requires a little bit of knowledge and strategy and swimming a little bit a different direction than the rest of our society to give our body what it needs so that unlike everyone around us, we don't have to be quite so out of balance. Yeah. Okay. All right. So on to um, anxiety, since the book is called Anatomy of Anxiety, you talk about a concept in the book, uh, well, two concepts, that there's true anxiety and false anxiety. So what do you mean by those two terms? Yeah, and I'm, I'm deep, deep in sort of wordsmithing and rethinking that and defending it. Oh. It's, a, it's such a, and so here's what I mean by it. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, a different way of like a different nomenclature for that could be that we have two types of anxiety, avoidable anxiety and purposeful anxiety. Okay. And purposeful anxiety it's not something to pathologize. It's something that it's our inner compass nudging us. It's telling us, slow down, pay attention. Something's not right here. Something needs to be addressed. We need to course correct in our lives in some way. And that can relate to um, how we're showing up in our work. It can relate to our relationships. It can be on a grander scale, some kind of activism that we know we feel called to participate in. That's our purposeful or true anxiety. It's not something that we're going to gluten-free or decaf coffee our way out of. It's not something to suppress. It's really our truth. And false anxiety or avoidable anxiety, on the other hand, I think is the most revolutionary idea that I think we desperately need as a society right now. And it's to recognize that a lot of what we're calling anxiety, heavy-duty mental health issues, have at their root a state of physical imbalance and that's where they need to be addressed and so it just recognizes that a lot of anxiety is simply the body tripped into a stress response so what trips our body into a stress response it can be anything from caffeine sensitivity to a hangover to sleep deprivation to gluten intolerance and other forms of inflammation or anything off with the digestive tract um, all the way to compare and despair while we scroll on Instagram. And so there's just all of these aspects of modern life that trip our body into a stress response. And that shows up as anxiety and even panic. And it doesn't have to be happening. It doesn't serve some greater purpose. It's not our deep inner truth. It's unnecessary suffering. And we can identify what's causing it, address that and walk away from a lot of unnecessary anxiety. Okay. So, um, for, you know, for anybody who obviously wants to know all of the potential causes of false anxiety and the ways to address it, or the ideas that you come up with, you go into great, great detail in the book, but can you give some examples of, um, you know, some strategies to alleviate false anxiety or to, to bypass false anxiety? Yeah, let's touch briefly on a few. I think the one I love to start with is sleep. And this is because we all struggle with sleep and we want to sleep. It's not like, you know, if I'm telling someone like, you have to um, quit coffee and get off of gluten and alcohol. It's like, we don't want to have that conversation. That's not fun. It can be effective, but that's a, you know, mm-hmm. We get to that, um, we're playing the long game here, but we want to sleep better. That's something that feels good and it's free and it helps us in every corner of our lives. But sleep eludes us and I think it's imminently treatable and it has to do with a lot of aspects of modern life that disrupt our circadian rhythm. But the most 
primary and easily intervened upon is actually our relationship to light. And light is what cues our circadian rhythm. It causes us to release cortisol in the morning in response to the sunrise, and then release melatonin in the evening in response to darkness. And that system was foolproof on that savanna of evolution, and it's completely jacked up in modern life. And mm -hmm. so I encourage people to not bring their phone into the bedroom with them, to not keep it on the bedside table. And then I brought a prop for this, but I encourage people to have some kind of blue blocking glasses that they put on at sunset and wear until bedtime. And these days you can get ones that look cute and stylish and normal, and you could do that. These happen to look like you're about to go do metallurgy, but mm -hmm. it's whatever floats your boat. Um, and that is such a beautiful kind of intervention that's inexpensive, it's non-invasive, and it works. It has high potential benefit. Um, so sleep is something I love to fix. Um, blood sugar is a really nice quick win when it comes to anxiety because uh, we're all on this blood sugar roller coaster in modern life because our diets are built on refined carbohydrates and coffee drinks that are secretly milkshakes and rosé all day. And so our mm -hmm. blood sugar is constantly spiking and then crashing. And every time it crashes, this induces a stress response in the body. And that can feel identical to anxiety. So I start by having my patients just use a hack, which is to take a spoonful of something like almond butter or for some people, ghee or coconut oil, and they'll do it in anticipation of their typical blood sugar crashes. So like if you pick a fight with your partner every day at 5.30 p.m., maybe you take a spoonful around 3 p.m. Or if you wake up throughout the middle of the night, that's often related to blood sugar. So you might take a spoonful right before you brush your teeth at night, and that can create a safety net of stable blood sugar, and it blunts a crash, and it can eliminate a lot of unnecessary anxiety and panic. Um, there's the conversation I alluded to a moment ago. It's not anybody's favorite conversation, but our relationship to substances like caffeine and alcohol um, has a pretty big impact on our anxiety levels. And it's, there's a lot of nuance to go into there, but, but overall just making conscious choices with both substances, maybe pushing caffeine a little earlier in the day, perhaps switching to half calf or black tea and decreasing the overall amount can be beneficial with anxiety. A lot of people with anxiety are actually just very sensitive to caffeine. And we, of course, wake up in caffeine withdrawal. We consume caffeine and it, it's the antidote to its withdrawal. That feels good, but it revs up our stress response. And alcohol um, creates this impact on a particular neurotransmitter in the brain called GABA, mm -hmm. which is very soothing and calming. We need GABA if we're struggling with anxiety. And that's part of why we like alcohol is that it washes our brain over with GABA. But in reclaiming homeostasis, our body converts that GABA to a different neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is very excitatory. And that's why after we've had a couple of drinks at dinner, we wake up at two or three in the morning, tossing and turning, irritable, racing thoughts, and we don't sleep well the rest of the night. That's that GABA to glutamate conversion and it's part of why anxiety contributes, or sorry, that alcohol contributes to anxiety. Yeah, I was reading something recently, new studies coming out that, you know, we've been told that, a, you know, a glass of wine is cardioprotective and all this stuff. And now they're saying, well, actually, one glass of alcohol can be pretty damaging, um, to your sleep and to other things where we have been sold this message that, you know, we're helping ourselves by having some red wine at night. Um, I think there's always been a lot of industry influence in the messaging we get around alcohol and large global meta-analyses reveal the fact that the healthiest amount of alcohol to consume is actually, it's not five ounces of red wine a day. It's actually zero, mm -hmm. which can be a tough pill to swallow and it's its own whole conversation around balancing our priorities but it's at least worth spreading that message yeah so let's while we're here on that word balancing I think a lot of people when you start bringing up ancestral type um, concepts and you know getting back to basics and changing the way that you eat and exercise and all this stuff they're just like whoa, whoa like you want me to buy you know, those weird toe shoes and walk barefoot and do all this <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff, you know, is there room in this for, you know, 
someone who has bad anxiety and they want to try some of these things, but without like giving up everything, how, what is the balance? Like, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, I think I have that tendency to kind of overwhelm people and which is particularly problematic when someone's struggling with anxiety and they're like, I'm anxious and overwhelmed in my life. And now you're telling me change everything and give up all that is good and wonderful and culinary joys of life. And, um, and I think the way I present it in the book is think of this as a buffet and you go toward what you're drawn to, um, start there. And if that's for one person changing their relationship to caffeine, okay. But someone else is like, that's absolutely not where I want to start. Then maybe they have an earlier bedtime and a spoonful of almond butter at bedtime. Maybe they just get their blue blocking glasses and start with that. Maybe someone else is just willing to start by supplementing with magnesium glycinate at bedtime. You can start with whatever feels approachable, accessible, um, what resonates. And then each change you make will decrease your burden of anxiety ever so slightly. And then this is incremental progress. And as you get a little bit less symptomatic, it can feel easier. The next change kind of feels more within reach. And you can take baby steps the whole way there. And oftentimes it's actually the most sustainable way to do this. Um, and I would say always effort should be somewhat proportional with symptoms. So if you're just a little bit anxious, maybe you just make a little bit of change and adjustments to your diet and lifestyle. And if you're really debilitated by anxiety, I would argue it's worth rolling up your sleeves and getting to work and having a pretty intense ramp up and therapeutic phase where you're making a lot of changes in your life in the name of feeling better and then once you've gotten into a good groove things get more maintenance mode it's not such an all-consuming full-time job to shift your diet and lifestyle you have more wiggle room and you've gotten habits in place so that you can just coast and so i think it's always going to be proportional with how much are you suffering yeah that makes sense um i'm somebody who went through and who is still actually going through psychiatric drug withdrawal myself coming off and i'm just wondering um i know that patients probably come to you because you're aware of the psychiatric drug withdrawal issue and the ways in which we have to taper slowly and that kind of thing um but do you feel like these concepts work for people in psychiatric drug withdrawal um, to support the withdrawal, but also for people like me who I didn't know about tapering. I had no idea. And so I did this horrible thing and ripped all the meds away and put myself in terrible psych drug withdrawal. And then really you want to talk about severe anxiety. You know, I was sort of a crash course in trying to find things like this that could be helpful. So when the system is all, you know, crazy and withdrawal, do some of these concepts still help in your experience with your patients? Yeah. I mean, I think that they, they help in a different way. Like if I'm taking someone who is not on any medication, like say they're medication naive Mm -hmm. and they're feeling anxious and they might be contemplating starting meds or using more of a diet and lifestyle approach. It's if we start from there. Um, I think a lot of these interventions can really take care of the problem of anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, bigger, like if there's considerable burden of trauma, that's a longer conversation. It's a bigger process. But a lot of symptoms can be managed with these diet and lifestyle interventions. If someone's in a process of discontinuing psychiatric medications, I think that these interventions are not going to sort of eradicate all symptoms, but they're going to be the, you know, part of a strategy to mitigate symptoms of withdrawal and how to support your body and make sure that you get through safely, sustainably. Um, So it's a big part of what I do in my practice is supporting patients through discontinuation. And I think of this as sort of necessary, but not sufficient. It can still be, um, but there's there's a lot that can go into mitigating and supporting withdrawal. Yeah, I'll say I I learned about all these concepts on my own, just sort of digging around and I got into, you know, the Chris Cressers and the Mark Sisons and learning about ancestral type things. And it was some of the only things that helped in withdrawal when I was in such a severe state was 
changing the things that I could control, right? Like how, what I ate and not having caffeine anymore and trying to, you know, do yoga and that kind of thing. So I, I'm all for it. I think what you're saying in the book makes total sense. And as someone who's tried the stuff in a severe state of withdrawal, um, for me, it's been really, really helpful. So it was like refreshing to read that um, you were mentioning a lot of some of the th same things that I had tried and feel like really worked for me. Yeah. I mean, two yeah. quick thoughts on that. I think one is that um, the way I think about discontinuation, in my book, I call it the silent epidemic. And I think that, you know, especially anyone clued into the medicating normal community, it, it's not so silent. You know, you're aware of this issue. Yeah. But I think, you know, I just want to shout from the rooftops that we just need to be aware. First of all, certainly informed consent up front when you're about to be prescribed a psychiatric medication in the first place. It's not to say, I, like, I'm a psychiatrist, I prescribe medication. I'm not here to say no one should be on psychiatric medications. I, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but we at least need to give people the um, full informed consent conversation. Here's how it might help. Here's some questionable efficacy. Here's what might occur in withdrawal. We just need the full story. And then we make a decision based on our current circumstances and our needs and what we're capable of doing to support ourselves in those moments. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking at all about withdrawal. That's not part of that initial conversation, and it ought to be. And when someone goes off of a psychiatric medication, um, I really just want people to know of the existence of withdrawal. This, I think, is truly epidemic. Um, I have friends, friends who like get an earful of my views on mental health on the regular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they sort of secretly on their own might go off of Lexapro or go off of Clonopin and be thrown into a really dark phase of their life and not even think to bring it up with me and not even think to identify it as withdrawal. And so I just realized like, we're not thinking about it in this way. We think about it as relapse. We think, well, our life circumstances changed and we're just in a tough patch. Um, we, we don't know to identify psychiatric medication withdrawal as a withdrawal state and to help just understand that the reason things got very dark and difficult and we might be feeling irritable, difficulty sleeping, even suicidal thoughts, that that can be related to psych med withdrawal. And so I think when we start from a place of at least identifying it, um, then we can work with that. The other thing is that you, you brought up like, I don't forget the other train of thought, so I'll let that one go. Okay. If it comes back, just let me know and we'll, okay. we'll go back. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll admit when I put up your book and um, said that we were going to have you on for a conversation, you know, people can comment on Facebook and that kind of thing. And that's a, that's a whole conversation too, right? Like all the social media we're exposed to and everyone's ideas and thoughts at once causes anxiety. But somebody said, Oh, you know, I'm expressing fatigue essentially at the idea that we should overcome anxiety. And he said, like, how can we overcome or why would we want to a natural needed response to the world? Shouldn't we essentially be writing books focusing on our cultural disorders instead? Yeah. Well, what would you say to that? Yeah, yeah, so I think that I, I totally appreciate that comment. And so everything we've focused on in this conversation thus far is the first half of my book. But mm -hmm. the second half of my book is exactly what this reader is bringing up, which is that, um, like, why are we blaming, like, kind of like blaming the individual when we are in a system that's making us sick? Um, and part of what we need to do, I think, is identify the subtle ways our system is making us sick and to whatever extent we have the ability to change that for ourselves and for our communities, we should, but we also need to be operating on more of an activist societal level to say, this is untenable and it's making people sick. Um, and it, you know, none of this is to sort of blame the person for their anxiety. This question of eradicating or overcoming anxiety, I think it's such an interesting and important point. Um, I don't want people suffering unnecessarily. So like a blood sugar crash, induced stress response that's creating a panic attack. I don't think that's serving us, but I also want that same person to realize I honor their anxiety, their true anxiety. That's the second half of the book. And I go quite a bit into the fact that we have a culture right now that tells people don't be so sensitive. 
And we sort of shame ourselves and each other for sensitivity. And I actually think there's something prophetic about sensitivity. Anybody who is tapped in, tuned in in these ways, like true anxiety, it's not what's wrong with us. It's actually what's right with us when we are viscerally connected to what's wrong with the world. So our anxious folks, these are actually people that we need to be, we don't need to be saying, don't be so sensitive. What we really need to be saying is, tell me what you know, because they're tuned in to how things are not okay. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they're here in a prophetic capacity. I think it's how we shift this whole enterprise toward less suffering for all people. And so I want that person to realize like, it, it, especially when you're anxious, it is fatiguing to be like, now you're telling me I'm supposed to be like gluten-free and then the, and like, I know that, I know how annoying that is. I was annoyed by that before I like, before it changed my life. But, um, but we can also start with the conversation around true anxiety, which is that your anxiety is not something to pathologize. And it's certainly not something we should be trying to suppress or eliminate. Um, we want to support you being no unnecessary symptoms, no unnecessary panic attacks, but that your anxiety is something to honor and listen to. Yeah. And you even make that case in the book really well with the story about the, well, it's not a, I mean, it, you told a story, but it was true. It was about, um, were they apes or they were, um, it was some kind of animal mm -hmm. that. Diane yeah. Fossey's research. Yeah. Yeah. But basically that, you know, and this actually, it's something I need to look into further because there's dispute in the field of like whether this is valid research. I don't know. I've learned all that since the book came out. But basically the idea here, which is compelling, you know, is that there were certain more anxious chimps in this tribe and that when she eliminated them from the tribe, that tribe was decimated. And basically the idea was that they were on the outskirts as the advanced warning system. They were the ones tapped into an elephant stampede is coming, the weather is changing, a storm is coming, and they were the ones not sleeping well and being hypervigilant, but it served a role for the whole community. And I think the same thing is true with humans. I think that anxiety is creating a lot of suffering. It's, it's a liability, but it's also an asset and a gift, and it is serving our community. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you talk in the book about how, you know, large corporations prey, well, they prey on us in general with all kinds of things, but specifically they prey on us with fear and anxiety as well. And, um, you tell everyone or warn everyone to, to sort of have an awareness that maybe you're being sold something when it comes to fear and anxiety. What, what would be an example of that? Yeah, I think it's just very empowering to realize we are living in the attention economy. Mm -hmm. It's our attention that is currently the commodity being competed for by really smart companies. And they've done their homework. They know their neuroscience and their behavioral psychology. And they know that if they prey on our fear or instill uncertainty or doubt or controversy, we will rubberneck. They will get more clicks. They'll get more ad revenue. But our mental health is often the collateral damage. And so at the very least, we need to make very conscious choices as we navigate the information landscape. And we have to be aware that people are sitting around in advertising firms and marketing departments, and they realize that fear sells. And so not for some deep malicious reason, but just because a company is trying to sell us something we probably fundamentally don't need. Mm -hmm. um, we are bathed in fear mongering and pretty unnerving messaging all the time, telling us we're broken, we're not okay, unless we buy their product. And um, on the one hand, don't bankrupt yourself and clutter your life by buying all these products. But on the other hand, wake up to the fact that um, someone's trying to sell you something using the tactic of fear. And this is making us go through our lives more anxious because we're bathed in so much fear messaging. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> speaking of messaging, I've seen recently that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which is um, pretty influential in the United States, is now recommending screening all children over eight for anxiety, over 12 for depression, and all adults 18 to 65 for both conditions. 
what do you think about this latest development, these mandatory screenings for people? I have mixed feelings about it. I, mm -hmm. I love destigmatizing mental health. I love having more of a conversation, making this something okay to talk about, um, giving us space to um, talk about how we're doing and have someone actually witness that and hear it, take it seriously. I think that's all a good thing. Um, in, in my world right now, there's a lot of um, people are sort of really rallying around the idea of we need more access to mental health care. And I think the problem there is, is two parts. It's yes, that mental health care is, is inaccessible and unaffordable and um, not always covered by insurance. Practitioners aren't always taking new patients. That's part of the problem. But a more nefarious and, and less easily solved part of the problem is that once you get into that appointment with a mental health practitioner, often what happens is that you talk for eight minutes, you might start crying and you walk out of there with a prescription or two. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually not a satisfactory way to support human mental health. And not only does it not effectively address the needs, but I think it can create new problems. So um, I think we need to get really, we need to change the conversation around what it means to get help, what it means to help mental health issues. And to me, there's a piece of good news here, which is that it's not something that we need to gatekeep behind the ivory towers of medicine. It's not something that has to be behind a paywall. It, so much of how we can support our mental health is free, is safe, it's accessible. It's something we can do for ourselves. So just as the commenter brought up, like I'm fatigued that I have to do all this stuff. Yes. And it can be somewhat empowering and a source of hope that we can do all these things, that we can support our mental health without waiting on a 12 week wait list to see an expensive practitioner that's a 45 minute drive from our home who doesn't even really get us. Um, I think that I, I want people to feel empowered by the fact that the real determinants of our mental health are largely in our own hands. And that can be overwhelming for sure, but also a bit empowering and hopeful. Mm -hmm. Now I get the comment all the time, like, oh, this is great, like in a Pollyanna type, you know, but I don't have money and resources. So how am I meant to help myself? Do you think there um, realistically are ways that people can do without a lot of resources to get started? Yep. I think there's a lot about eating well that's expensive. Those are the facts. I think there's a lot about eating unwell that's expensive, partly in the like ordering a bunch of individual meals on seamless web, but also being sick is expensive. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it, being unable to function in our lives is expensive. But I think the more important point here is that most of what I recommend is free. It's, it's free. It's effortful, um, but it's free. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first to say, we don't all have the same 24 hours in a day. We don't all have the same energy, but um, there are shockingly many very approachable, easy, free things that we can do for ourselves that little by little can support our mental health. And um, so I think that I know that like wellness gets this reputation of being a very privileged pursuit. And that's unfortunate, I think, because um, I know like I come across and like blonde and it's like looks so wellnessy. And um, but I'm here to talk about like, you know, these are six dollars on Amazon and they'll change your life. It'll change your sleep, which will change all mental health issues. Um, and supplementing with something like magnesium is dirt cheap. Um, and repleting a, a nutrient that most of us are deficient in, breath mm -hmm. work, earlier bedtime, getting outside. Um, most of these things are, are, are free or extremely inexpensive, and they make all the difference. Um, in many ways, they're more affordable than even seeing a provider covered by insurance and going every month to the pharmacy. So I think it's um, in certain ways inaccurate to say that this is only accessible to those with resources or with privilege. I think that this is actually um, effortful, but not expensive. Yeah. I wish I would have known we were bringing our glasses. I, mine are in my bedroom and they're more fashionable than yours, but I got them from a, from Poshmark. So we're talking about saving money. They were like 
you know, a secondhand store or whatever, but yeah. <clears throat> so last question, this one is kind of, um, you know, it, people are split, I guess I'll say in the, at least in the critical, you know, movement of questioning medications and our mental health system. You talk some in the book about psychedelics and also about marijuana, which is uh, likely to be legal, you know, all over the United States and maybe in most countries here before long. Um, what are your thoughts on psychedelics and marijuana? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you asked. I mean, basically, we're so <laughs> we're, we're at such a moment of like um, intolerance of nuance in in our conversations these days and just as we need more nuance with psychiatric medication conversations, um, the psychedelic and cannabis conversation, they're, they're nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, so when I come forward and I say, you know, I think psychedelics are a promising new line of treatment in mental health, I'm not saying everyone should drop acid today. Like it's, yeah. it's not like that. It's, um, but we are in crisis as a field. We have not been serving the mental health needs of the population. We leave a lot to be desired. And I think having a promising new line of treatment is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And does it come with risks? Potentially, yes. Um, it's not appropriate for all people, all brains, all indications. And I don't just say that as a medical, legally cautious, um, sort of covering myself. Like I, I firmly believe they're not appropriate for all brains. I think that if a system is already chaotic, I don't necessarily want to introduce new chaos. Mm -hmm. But if a system is entrenched and stuck, I think um, shaking that snow globe and letting the snow fall in a different pattern can be really helpful. So I, I think that this warrants more research and, and just societal openness to thinking creatively about how do we support mental health mm -hmm. and even the implications of why new lines of treatment might be more efficacious than what we currently have. Because part of the reason psychedelic medicines are effective, it's familiar to us. They're some of them active on the 5-HT2A receptor. They're impacting serotonin levels. They can be anti-inflammatory. They can promote neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. So they can allow us to change and adapt, think about things differently. There's all these ways that are sort of familiar, but I think something else that psychedelics do pertains to something called the mystical experience hypothesis, mm -hmm. where um, there have been studies that demonstrate that the degree to which somebody has a peak mystical experience um, in a psychedelic ceremony correlates with the antidepressant effect. So that to me really stops me in my tracks because this is not just um, kind of supporting serotonin, serotonin functioning at a 5-HT2A site. This is about, um, as my colleague Will Sue puts it, he says psychedelics are not just agents of healing trauma, they are tools for making spirituality palatable for our starving Western world. And I think sometimes this gets at that those psycho-spiritual needs where we need some relationship to meaning, purpose. How do we want to make sense of uncertainty in life and where can we feel trust and where can we feel okay? And these are difficult and unanswerable questions in the human condition. But I think psychedelics give us permission to seek those questions and and to, to really live those questions in a way that can be really healing. And on the safety side of things, I mean, part of the reason why people get into trouble with psychiatric medications is the way they're prescribed, you know, every day, long term, take it like it's your medicine, you know, three times a day, which means you're basically bathed in the chemical from morning until night. But are psychedelics more of like a burst type, you know, short intermittent therapy, and then you get a break from them or? Yeah, there's so many different approaches. And there's a lot of people kind of interested in microdosing, a sort of idea of almost like a pinch hitter for psychiatric medications. You know, you stop your Lexapro and you take your microdose psilocybin instead. In my personal experience and observations in my practice, I'm less excited and I find that to be a less promising route as much as it appeals to our Western mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but these medicines work much more often as sort of a, a periodic macro dose that you have a, you know, in a safe and appropriate clinical setting, you have a big experience. And then the lion's share of how this makes a difference in our mental health 
is not what happens in that moment of the ceremony or in that intervention or treatment. It's in the integration. It's in therapy afterward, where it has opened up a window of making new and bigger progress with therapy so that we can actually have an encounter with trauma, reformulate that, address it at the level of our limbic system and our nervous system. We can start to make behavioral change. We can start to understand our relationships differently. All these things that really move the needle in how we feel day to day, it, it happens in the integration therapy after ceremony. Um, cannabis, just to touch on it quickly, mm -hmm. um, same thing. It just requires nuance. For some people, it's good medicine. For some people, it's not good medicine. Um, and for some people, it's good medicine when used periodically, but once it becomes daily use, it's no longer good medicine. So mm -hmm. we just need the broad nuanced conversation. We don't need to completely have moral panic or shame around certain substances. I think it's on the menu, bring it into the conversation and think, think about it in terms of that individual and what's going to help them in this moment. Yeah. Okay. That makes excellent sense. Thank you for explaining that. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm aware of the time we're about finished, I guess, before we close, um, do you have any last final thoughts or do you want to, um, direct people towards, um, you on social media or your website, anything like that before we go? I think a last final thought is simply that, um, I think that, you know, that, that fatiguing first half of my book of telling someone to do all these things, I get it. It's annoying. I know it's hard. Um, it, I wouldn't keep barking about it if I haven't witnessed it change the lives of all my patients, my own physical and mental health. Um, but I think that if you could do one thing and prioritize one thing over and beyond everything else, it's actually community. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something harder to prescribe. Like I can, I can give someone actionable strategies around wearing blue blocking glasses or repleting nutrient stores in their bodies or addressing autoimmune disease. That's actionable. Community is tough. Relationships mm -hmm. are tough, but we actually need to have this be our primary priority. We as human beings, it's in our hardwiring. I think this relates to the fact that we were never the fastest species. We were never the strongest species. We were the ones that figured out how to cooperate. And it's for that reason that when we feel held in community and richly connected, we feel safe. Mm -hmm. And when we feel isolated, disconnected, um, ostracized, on some level in our DNA, it feels like it's a matter of life or death. And the modern environment is very conducive to isolation. And relationships are hard, even under the best of circumstances. So I think we need to work at that and prioritize that. There's an excellent book called The Book of Boundaries by Melissa Urban that I think really is very profound in how it can help support showing up in relationships in a way that we feel like we're able to communicate our needs, recognize our worthiness of getting our needs met, change how we're showing up for each other. But we need to put in that work so that we can preserve our relationships. And just for clarification, do you think connection via the internet like you and I are doing now or you know your your friends on social media is that is that enough I think it's something but I don't think it's enough mm -hmm. um, so I don't totally discount it I get a lot of benefit from um, all kinds of online community and interactions um, but I have that as part of a more diverse diet where I'm also interacting with people in real life and I think we need to balance the two. When we're only on our screens, we do need to recognize it's an opportunity cost from feeling that itch to connect with people in real life. And if there are people physically in the room with us and we're addicted to our screens, I think it's a real loss when it's pulling us out of the present moment, out of the people in the physical room with us. So I think we just need to get good at um, stepping out of the addictive relationship to it get the benefit, use it, don't let it use you, and then make sure that you're also getting your need for physical connection with other people met. Yeah. Okay. So if you would like to purchase um, Dr. Vora's book, it's again, The Anatomy of Anxiety, and we're going to link it um, in the description if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. We'll also put links to her social media so you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram and um, 
check out her website, all things like that. Um, so thanks so much for joining us for this live discussion. If you haven't seen Medicating Normal yet, you can by going to our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. There's ways to rent it. You can even buy it. You can get a DVD now. For more conversations like this one, we list them on Facebook under our events tab. And lastly, if you'd like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and more conversations like this one to communities worldwide, you can make a donation at medicatingnormal.com slash donate, or you can support us for the cost of a cup of coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash mnfilm. So thanks so much again, Dr. Vora, for joining us. And please do keep in touch. Let us know how your book is going. And um, yeah, thanks, everybody. Well, Talk thank to you, you soon. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.